How's it going, Church of the Highlands? How's it going, Church of the Highlands? Oh, there it is. Come on, somebody. And I know we're already clapping, but I do have a question. Who's excited to be in church today? Put your hands together. Every location. Come on, somebody. Well, I know, I know there's a big game tonight, but this is where I want to be right here. This is the real Super Bowl at Church of the Highlands. You might love your church. I mean, it's just amazing uh, what, what, God is, what God is doing here. And do want to officially welcome our campuses. Uh, anyone who's joining us online, we're so glad to have you guys. Of course, the men and women of the Alabama Correctional Facilities, we love all of you. One more time, put your hands together for your church family. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, I am so excited, so honored. Honestly, just couldn't even hardly sleep last night to be here with you guys today. Um, we're going to just have so much fun in God's Word today. As we're in week two of a series we're calling ER, uh, which stands for Extraordinary Relationships. And we don't want just ordinary. Come on, can I get an amen, somebody? We want extraordinary, and that, although that may seem impossible, with God it is possible. And if you weren't here last week, I mean, Pastor Chris kicked it off with one of the best messages ever. One person clapped over here. I'm, I'm gonna clap over here. It was, it was good. Um, and really set us up with a message around the, the heart and how relationships all are a matter of the heart. If you missed that, definitely go back and watch it. It really sets the tone for this whole series. And I'm excited today. We're gonna kind of spend the next four weeks getting super practical in different areas. Um, and I wanna kick off today with a verse that Pastor Chris brought out last week that really will be our theme verse as we jump in God's word today. This is Romans chapter 12, uh, verse two says, don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. And I wanna pause right there because it can be so easy, especially in the world we live in today, to blend into culture without even recognizing what's happening. Yeah. That we would just start drifting in every area, especially relationships. And I love how the Bible says, you know, you've been looking this way, just, this is, this is the first step. This is the series right here. We're gonna fix our attention on God. And when we do that, guys, things begin to change. I believe that's what's been happening in our church and even other places around America in 2023. I don't know if you feel it. Uh, if you don't, let me just tell you just, just some stats that will encourage you today. This year alone, so I don't know how many, the last six weeks, whatever it is in 2023, at Church of the Highlands, we have seen 3,853 wow. salvations. Come on, somebody. It's a miracle. There's a shift happening. We're fixing our attention on God, the world's way isn't working. This past Thursday down in Auburn, shout out to Auburn at our college service, one, you saw in the news a, a promotion for that. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, the spirit of God moved. There was a few people going, planning to get baptized and they ended up having a spontaneous baptism with dozens of college students getting baptized. God is moving. Now, I just read a stat the other day that says in America now, this is uh, since in the last 18 months, now over 52% of American teenagers are looking to Jesus for answers. It's a big shift of things we've seen over the last decade or so. God is moving. What's the difference is when we take our attention off the world and we fix our attention on God. And that's, that's the heart of this series. We have to do that. If, we, if we're looking this way, we're never gonna find the answers. If we look to God, we will find every answer we need. And this is what's gonna happen. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture, culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best in you and develops a well-formed maturity in us. What a beautiful scripture to set the tone for this series. Okay, so here we are in part two. Again, every week's gonna be something practical, but today we're gonna lock in with a topic that we want to become well-formed maturity, and it's a topic that hits 100% of all of us, resolving conflict. Yeah. That's right, Jason gave me a yeah, that's an amen, all right? And it's, we're gonna have fight night here at Church of the Highlands. This is about to be awesome. We're gonna figure it all out, right? But no, we're gonna, we're gonna dig into this because it really does conflict is a huge area for every relationship. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And the cool thing is the Bible has a ton to say on conflict. In fact, the entire Bible, honestly, cover to cover, is a book of conflict between people, between nations, between us and God. There is conflict everywhere. So it's a beautiful place for us to look. And we're gonna study today a New Testament scripture and an Old Testament scripture. And it is gonna, I believe, gonna be impactful for all of us, not just in our heads. I think we'll learn something, but I'm praying that God changes our hearts. And so we're going to jump into Ephesians chapter four as our New Testament scripture. And y'all, I am, again, I'm so excited. I feel like we're about to embark on a biblical adventure right now. I am excited. Are right? y'all ready? Anybody love the Bible, right? Okay, here we go. Ephesians four, I'm sorry, I'm just fired up today. Ephesians four, verse 26 says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now this is a, this is a packed scripture. 
And I want to focus first off on those first two words, be angry. The Bible allows for anger. The Bible allows for conflict. Write it down this way. All relationships have conflict. And I want to point this out and we'll kind of reiterate it throughout the message today. Conflict is not our enemy because we're going to be, and we're going to have conflict. And we actually, will, as we'll see today, we need conflict in relationships to bring health. Of course, doing it the right way. So all relationships have conflict. So you're gonna have conflict with your siblings growing up. Anybody have conflict with your siblings growing up? I know I did in my house. We love each other, but there was conflict. Um, I was always getting beat up by my older sister and cousins, which was embarrassing, you know? It's just like, whatever, but that, I've, I've moved past that. And so, right, we have conflict with neighbors. We have conflict with coworkers. We have conflict, you know, with, with people we meet on the street, on 280 in traffic. We have conflict with our spouse. I, I don't know about your marriage, but every once in a while, Jill and I have conflict. So conflict is everywhere. We have to recognize that. And it's, you know, oftentimes small conflict, the day in, day out conflict. You know, co small conflict's the kind of conflict that you don't even remember why you had it. The, you know, by the end of it, y'all know what I'm talking about? It's like, right, right. why were we fighting? Jill and I's first fight, actually, as a married couple. Um, so we went on our honeymoon. Y'all know on the honeymoon, everything's perfect. We're never gonna fight. Oh, we're so in love. And we get back, and it's probably like two weeks later, we're in this fight, and I don't even remember what it was about. We were trying to remember, and we couldn't figure out what it was, it was all about um, now. But we were you know, arguing in the car. We were arguing in the parking lot. We lived in this little one-bedroom apartment in, in downtown Birmingham. We were arguing in the elevator on the way up, and we get into this apartment. You can't escape each other, and we're arguing in the apartment. And finally, I guess just to get away, Jill like storms off. She's like, I just need a break. I got to get away from you for a minute, clear my head. She goes to take a shower. I'm fuming on the couch. I'm thinking of the next, I'm, I've got all my, like, all my ammunition ready. When she comes out, I'm gonna tell her exactly this, and I'm gonna win this fight, you know? And all I know is about three minutes later, she's so mad, she starts yelling at me from the shower. <laughs> and then she comes out of the shower, to which I turn around and say, you win, it's over. <laughs> it's the best fight of my life. This is amazing, right? That was our first fight. So it's like small fights are everywhere, and then what we don't wanna see happen is those small fights become big fights. Right. Those small things develop into the kind of conflict that fractures relationships and friendships and coworkers or business par partners, the kind of conflict that I think many of us honestly today have walked in with, is that we're walking through something that it, it, may have, it may have even started big, but it probably started small and it's grown to something big. And, and we gotta fight in the middle of that kind of conflict for God's way. Um, I was talking with Pastor Dino this week. He was sharing a story of a man who came down in prayer a while back to him and was just asking for prayer for him and his brother, that they had been in conflict for 25 years and not, not spoken to each other. Wow. It's heartbreaking. When he asked what, you know, what happened, he said, well, you know, 25 years ago, he stole $1,200 from me, which is terrible. $1,200 is a lot of money, but it's not worth 25 years. Right. 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 I don't know what the conflict you're in looks like. I know I've been through so many different conflicts and so many different relationships. And again, the enemy is not conflict. What we wanna learn in this is how to do conflict the right way, God's way. In fact, write this down. You know, all relationships have conflict. What extraordinary relationships have is healthy conflict. And that's our, that's our goal. That's what we're aiming for today uh, in this message. We're aiming for healthy conflict. And that's what the rest of Ephesians 4 gives us. And this is, I feel like it's super practical. Uh, just the last, really, three things this verse highlights. Uh, you know, it says, do not sin, do not, do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let's look at that first phrase, do not sin, and write this down. Healthy conflict, the kind we want, is safe. So the Bible says be angry. I think that's important, again, to remember. It just said be angry, but do not sin. So there's a difference in our anger, frustration, and sin. There is a line that is, on this side of the line, anger is what we feel, and the Bible allows for that and actually encourages that. That's a natural emotion, but where we have a boundary is we don't step across the line to make that feeling an action. We just got to decide if we're going to be, you know, the, follow the, the model of the Bible. Again, we can have conflict, but we got to know there are boundaries to this conflict. And those are boundaries that we just are unwilling uh, to cross. You know, fighting safe, or conflict never gets physical. We fight fair. You know, we're not dragging up old issues. Uh, we stay focused on the issue, not the person. You know, we have control of the tongue. How about that one? That one's difficult. You know, no screaming, no, no yelling, no saying stuff we're gonna regret. Our mouth can get us in, in trouble really fast in a conflict, right. amen? Right. Am I the only one? Right. Right. Uh, I'm just, this is like, today's like a confession for me, all right? So I'm gonna give you one more conflict story of my own life. My mouth definitely got me in trouble. So I have four boys, uh, and they all love flag football. Flag football is a great sport. I hate that we didn't have it when I was growing up. 
And so they've all played flag football and they love it, but I think I take it a little bit too far. And some of you dads out there, y'all gotta feel me right now. It's important to them. For me, it's like life and death. We're gonna win the championship every single year. And so a few years back, one of my boys was playing on a team that wasn't very good, which is, you know, so frustration's building all season long. And we make it to the playoffs because nowadays everybody makes it to the playoffs. It doesn't matter, right? What your record is, you're in. And we win a couple games and now we're in the, the really important like semifinal or something. And we get the worst ref in the history of America. He's not calling flag guards. He is calling flag guards where they shouldn't be. And I am just getting so frustrated. I'm on the sideline. I'm up, you know, first of all, you're sitting in your little chair. Now I'm standing up now. I'm pacing now. I'm giving a little talk back, right? A little feedback. I'm making sure he knows. That wasn't a great call, ref. And it starts elevating to, that's a terrible call, ref, to you're a terrible ref, you know, like, and it's just building up. And in between a play, true story, in between a play, this ref walks over to me, looks at me straight in the eye and he says, now, Pastor Mark. Jesus, like Holy Spirit, like, he's like, I'm gonna need you to calm down. I'm like, I repent, you're an amazing ref. You're the best ref in the history of the world. <laughs> right, we don't wanna say stuff we're gonna regret. We don't wanna let ourselves cross that boundary. You guys got that. The next phrase, do not let the sun go down on your anger. And this is so important, healthy conflict is timely. Uh, now, the first service thought this was kind of funny, but a few weeks ago, I was reading the Constitution. <laughs> Whatever, I think it's important for us to know, you know, the rules, right? And I thought this was interesting. The Sixth Amendment says this, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. And that relates so well to this point. You know, that, that's in the amendment so that someone isn't endlessly held in custody, that you actually at some point have to step into the trial, you have to step into the conflict. And I thought, man, what a strong just connection to a reality that can be in our life is that we allow time, we think time's gonna diffuse a conflict, but it doesn't, it only builds pressure up. That's good. And we're, That's before good. we know it, we're endlessly held in custody. Some of us feel that way today, I have felt that way. We are held in custody by this conflict. We can't be around them at Christmas. We avoid them in the hallways. You know, we, we could change so much about our life just because there's now this, this kind of elephant in the room that we're trying to get around rather than just going straight at it. And, I mean, all the research says this is incredibly unhealthy for us. The Bible is backed up by tons of research that timely conflict is incredibly important. And if we're not, you know, if we're def trying to let delay or def diffuse conflict through time, all, that, all that's happening is pressure is building up inside of us, which creates all kinds of health. I mean, it, it'll, make our, it'll affect our appetite and our energy and it'll give us anxiety, all these things, all these byproducts. It's like a, you ever put dry ice in, a, in, a, in like a two liter bottle? That may be illegal. I don't know if I should say that here today, but like you can put dry ice in a bottle, a little bit of water, put the top on it, and that pressure builds. Some of y'all have done that before. And all of a sudden, it explodes. It's amazing to watch. It's really not good, though, in conflict. Because time, it builds pressure between us and the other person inside of us. And before we know it, it can spill over uh, into every area of our life. So we gotta keep conflict timely. We, we can't cross that line into sin. And here's the last part of the of scripture. It says, give no opportunity to the devil. And, and honestly, this to me is the most important part. And this is now laser focus where I want us to go today. Healthy conflict is resolved. What, so the question when I read that is, what is, what is the opportunity the devil's looking for? And I really believe it is for unresolved conflict because we know that he is a liar who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Right, right. That's good. And right. if he can see the open door of conflict, he sees the opportunity to do exactly that between us and others. And the enemy loves, if he sees that opportunity, he loves to seize it in our marriage, in our friendships, with our siblings, in every area we've talked about. He loves to have that opportunity. And honestly, guys, we have to be honest with this um, because we're seeing, what we're seeing in our world today really is a byproduct of this. I believe we've given the enemy opportunity in our culture to bring division. We see it politically, we see it racially, we see it interpersonally, we see it in so many different areas. And it's so wicked right now that, that what the enemy's wanting to do to us is not only does he want to divide us, he wants to make it impossible for us to resolve the conflict. We call it cancel culture. But there's a conflict and it's, it's, it's whatever happened, it's done and there is no hope. The bridge is, is broken. There is no hope for us to repair this relationship. And y'all, it is, it is of the enemy. It's of the, it's of the devil himself. Yeah. There has to be accountability. Hear me clearly. Accountability is important. But no relationship is disposable. I need a better amen. No relationship is disposable. God didn't cancel us. We don't cancel other people. I said God didn't cancel us. We don't cancel other people. We gotta find a way through it. Boundaries, yes. Accountability, yes. Canceling, never. Listen to the Bible. This is a powerful scripture. 2 Corinthians 13 
Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. One another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. We all want God's love. We all want God's peace. The Bible says strive for full reconciliation, restoration. That's our aim. That's our goal. And I feel the weight. Y'all, I've been praying so hard this week. And I feel the weight of this topic. And I've tried to have a little bit of fun, which I mean, we, had, we gotta have fun in a topic like conflict. But I don't wanna seem dismissive at all of the weight that you may be carrying right now on one of our campuses, anywhere you are with that conflict. And it's just been in my heart all week long, the, the man or woman that will be sitting here today feeling like it's impossible for God to do something. And if nothing else today, hopefully some of this is practical. I'm praying that our faith is built, that there is always a way for restoration. That no matter where we are, it is not the end. And honestly, I was kind of building this whole message more on the practical side. And halfway through, the Holy Spirit just stopped me. I mean, I had, I had a whole outline built for the bottom part of this message. And I felt the Holy Spirit stop me and say, all that's just self-help unless the heart is changed. All that content's great. Y'all, there's content everywhere for conflict resolution. And it's great content. But if our heart is not postured right, then all that's just gonna be at best, our own effort. And we're not looking for ordinary, we're looking for extra ordinary. Amen, everybody? So I wanna do, what I wanna do to close out is just speak straight to the heart from an Old Testament scripture. So we studied Ephesians 4, now we're gonna look at Genesis chapter 50. And I think there are four lessons in this scripture that are gonna really help our heart be postured for the opportunity to do what only God can do. So that we can do our part, which is gonna allow God to do his part. And I think if we can do that in all relationships, we're gonna have the ability to step into this next week, this next month, this next year with hope uh, for all those relationships. Genesis 50, uh, I'm gonna start in verse 19 and then give a little bit of context. It says, but Joseph said to them, and I wanna, I wanna pause right there. This guy, Joseph, is important for us to understand, who, it's important for us to understand who this guy is, all right? So Joseph is the son of Jacob, who's the son of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham, who is the son of Terah, who we talked about last week. Y'all remember Terah and that whole story. So we're kind of in that same family line. And this is a, this is, if you never studied this family, it'll encourage you. If you think the Bible is just about perfect people, go read the family story of Abraham's family. I mean, there, it, it really is like the best material for a reality show ever. I'm not exaggerating. It, it could actually be a soap opera, even worse than reality show, soap opera, right? And I mean, I was just thinking about the, the content. You know, it's like Days of Our Lives has got a lot of drama, nothing on all Abraham's children. I mean, I know it's kind of cheesy, but it's, it's true. My grandmother, uh, Y'all, my grandmother just passed away. She was 101. Wow. Y'all, she loved Church of the Highlands. She, she joined Church of the She went to the growth track at 97. <laughs> Isn't that amazing, everybody? Oh, it's, she loved Pastor. It's what she'd always say. I love my pastor. And she'd always, you know, he sends the Christmas cards. Every, every one of his Christmas cards was on her refrigerator all year long. She's like, I just love his family. And she loved, her, she loved Church of the Highlands. Now, the music was a little loud, but she's like, I can't hear that well anyway, so I'm Okay. <laughs> By the way, just, this is, has nothing to do with the message. Y'all want a life lesson from someone who lived 101? Yeah. She ate bacon every day. Wow. She cooked in butter. Come on, somebody. She cooked in butter. She cut her own grass cut her, until she was like 99 years old, and she did a crossword puzzle every night. There it is. If you want to live to 101, <laughs> bacon, butter, grass, and, and crossword puzzles. Amen. <laughs> But her, her name was Graham, and I just laugh at Graham because um, she would babysit me when I was a kid before, you know, my parents both worked, so I, before I was in school, she would babysit me. And she would always lay me down for a nap, you know, right as Sesame Street came on. Y'all remember Sesame Street? Oh, yeah. But then when she, she thought I was asleep, she would change over to her favorite soap opera. <laughs> it was like, I, you know, I, One Life to Live, I think was the name of it. And, and you know, it was, it was bad. If she ever saw that I was awake, she'd always be like, cover your ears and cover your eyes, which is really hard to do that. It's like, how do you, you know... How do you do that? It's, she got, she kind of got in trouble though. One day when my mom heard me say, you know, someone said, "What's your favorite TV show?" And I'm like, "One Life to Live." <laughs> it's like five years old. But there's so you know, soap operas are built on drama, and honestly, Abraham's family is full of drama, so much conflict, which gives us, it's like a perfect. We can observe it. We can look at it. We can learn from it. it gives us a perfect opportunity. I'm so grateful the Bible's honest, and doesn't hold back, because our lives need to be honest as well. And we're going through real life. And so in Abraham's family, I mean, there's deceit, there's betrayal, there's anger, there's infidelity, there's broken marriages, there's abandonment, there's bitterness, there's jealousy, there's favoritism. And all of that's before we even get to Joseph. And if you know his story, it's a tragedy from the, almost the very beginning. I mean, there was favor on his life. His dad actually favored him out of all 12 of his brothers. 
Um, but that created jealousy. And this family was so unhealthy, this is how they dealt with conflict. The person they had a conflict with, the jealousy with, they took him, they threw him in a pit, and then they sold him into slavery. Now we can read that, but let's put ourselves in the seat of Joseph right now. What would that have felt like? Some of you feel that in that kind of betrayal in your own life. The people who should love me the most have treated me the worst. And you would think, well, maybe there's a redemption right there, but there's not. He's actually sold into slavery, spends 13 years in Potiphar's house. Part of that time, he's in prison. In prison, you know, there's again favor on his life, but in prison, he, he, he interprets this dream and he sh that should have been his ticket out, but the person he helped get out ends up forgetting it and he stays in prison even longer. Finally, he's brought out of prison. He ends up in this, in this position in Egypt where he is really a prince of Egypt. He has got control of, of all the resources. And about that time, a famine hits the whole area, Egypt, Israel, that whole, that whole area of the world. And out of nowhere, these brothers who years ago had sold him in slavery, that pain that he had walked through show up in Egypt. And they're asking him for help. Can you all believe it? And at first, they don't recognize who he is, but then they recognize who he is. And I think what makes this story especially powerful and the reason I want us to study it today is when they recognize who it is, verse 17, we're not gonna read it, but you can go look in chapter 50, verse 17. It's the first time the word forgiveness is ever spoken in the Bible. Wow. This is an important story. His brothers come to him and they say, can you forgive us? And that's where we're gonna pick up with Joseph and four lessons, again, four lessons from his life that I think are, are so important. Here's the first one. We're gonna see this in Joseph's life. It starts within us. Conflict resolution, God's way, always starts within us. Genesis 50, 19 says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? What he's really saying here is, what right do I have to judge? Well, I mean, from my position, Joseph, you have every right to judge. Those jokers threw you in a pit. They put you in, they, they sold you. They made money off of you and put you in slavery. And that led to years of pain and trauma. Am I in God's seat? You can just sense before we even know any more of the story that Joseph has already let a work start on the inside of him. Before he ever steps into that public or outward conflict, he's already allowed the Holy Spirit to do work inside of him. He has this posture of humility. And I don't know about you, but I wanna know how to live that way because that I've gone through some stuff, but I had never gone through nothing like that. And I think in a position of power like Joseph, I'd have been like, all right, y'all are back. I'm gonna put you in prison. I'm gonna sell you into slavery. I'm gonna take you out. But I mean... I, it's completely different. Am I, am I in God's seat? Am I in the place of God? It's a, a beautiful text. So how does he live this way? And I think these will help our hearts again. I think number one, Joseph has taken ownership of his own part of the conflict. I think Joseph is just recognizing that we have to start this way. To me, this is the key that unlocks the door for conflict resolution is, you know what? Before I talk to them, I'm gonna look at myself. And you know what? It was mostly their fault, but there were these two or three things. I mean, I'm the kind of guy that honestly... I don't know if it's pride, whatever it is. When I'm in an argument, my immediate feeling is I'm all right and they're all wrong. Anybody else out there? Like, yeah, yeah. And I know all the reasons why. But I have noticed in moments of humility, if I let the Holy Spirit speak to me, there's always at least one thing that I could have done better. And I think it's so important for us to start there because it begins to soften our heart. And these are even important words from Jesus. Matthew chapter seven, he says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly, and that's what we wanna do. We want conflict to be clear. Then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's a powerful scripture is that we would check ourselves before we look to another person. I think Ice Cube said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. That's right. And so it's, it's just a great life principle, right? Because if we check our motivations, our intentions, it may just be one or two things, but there's something there. Good, now, nothing else, check this, look at me, it's gonna give us empathy for the other person, which is so needed in conflict resolution. Instead of anger, we begin to grow empathy. And then still underneath this idea of it starts within us, I know for a fact, we see it in scripture, that Joseph has already been looking to God to do what only he can do. Joseph does not expect in this conversation for his brothers to heal the pain that's in his heart. And I know that for me, a lot of times in conflict, I think if I can get the W, right? If I can prove them wrong, if I can get them to, to apologize, if I can get them to repent, that something that they could do in that moment would then help heal the, the pain or the frustration or the hurt that's in my heart. And it is not true. Only God can heal. Yeah, that's good, Mark. 
the other person, it becomes, if, if it's about healing, it will crush that moment. It, it will make conflict about all the wrong things. But if we let God heal our heart and begin the process of healing our heart, and it is a process, if we invite God into that process, then the, the argument or the conflict actually becomes about restoring relationship, not about healing. God is doing what he can do, and now we're engaging. We're fighting for the friendship, for the relationship, for the marriage, whatever it might be. That we're fighting for the right thing, the thing that is possible through the conflict. And that is a unity that would come out on the other side. I think it's very clear. I mean, Genesis 41 proves this. It says Joseph, this is, you know, this is uh, nine chapters before we're reading in Genesis 50. It says Joseph named, uh, Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, it is because God has made me forget all the trouble of my father's household. That God's already been at work. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. This is so powerful. How do we do this? I think practically speaking, the only way to, to let it start within ourselves is in the place of prayer. And I wanna give you two scriptures, Psalm 139, Psalm 34. If nothing else from this message, you grab hold of both of those. Search me and know me. Come on, God, show me if there's anything inside of me, anything in me that is wrong. God, show me. I'm, I, am, I am open to you. And then, and then Psalm 34, God is close to the brokenhearted. I invite you into my broken heart. God, I'm inviting you to do what only you, can, only you can heal and I'm inviting you in. If we do both of those things, God will start to work. If we pray that and believe that, God's gonna soften the ground in our own heart, which is the only way we're ever gonna, you know, again, take that key and open the door to conflict resolution. Here's the next lesson we're gonna learn. This comes from verse 20, Genesis 50:20. It says, you intended to harm me. So the first thing out of his mouth is, am I in God's seat? But what I love next, and this is our lesson, is that he's completely honest right here. Lesson number two is it takes, it takes a complete honesty. That he, he's saying to them, you, you intended to harm me. Joseph is not holding back here the facts of the case. Now, what's easy for us to do in conflict, right, is to be on one of the extremes. It's to be on like the anger extreme where I'm yelling and frustrated or on the passive extreme where I'm just, you know what, you're right, you're right. I'm just taking it all, taking it all, taking it all. But wisdom says right there in the middle, sticking to the facts, here's what happened. Here's how that made me feel. It is the only way we can get to conflict resolution. Anything else other than that either becomes sin and unhealthy or else there's still something left. And so it's actually never fully resolved. The relationship doesn't have integrity. Some of us struggle with honesty, but we gotta know God is going to be with us. When we are honest, it is, it is now the doorway. We've opened, we've unlocked the key. Now we're stepping through the doorway and that doorway is honesty. And fruit, it, the things that, I mean, we don't, we, we wanna pre-predict the end of a conflict, you know how it's gonna come out, but God has so many more things in store. When I, got, I don't have much time, but one of my favorite stories down at our Auburn West campus is of a couple who divorced in the early 2000s Life was busy, life was hectic, they separated, things happened. They were raising a, a, just an amazing daughter. And so because of that, they, they, they were just constantly trying to you know, fight for just, just, just the ability to have normal everyday conversation to make their, their co-parenting healthy. And through that, they, they began to have these conversations and through that, God began to work in their heart. And they both end up at Church of the Highlands in Auburn. And over a, a, a period of time, uh, the pastor of that campus invites both of them to a small group without them knowing that the other was invited. Isn't that great? Y'all pastors are crazy around here. Just watch it, all right, all right? And it's a marriage small group. And they get there, and you know, day one of the, of the small group, hey, everybody, we're having a marriage. We're, this is a marriage small group. And as shocking as that was, they pressed in, and slowly, this is what I love about their story, not all at once, because that encourages me, but conversation after conversation, they started getting honest, vulnerable, sharing their expectations, their assumptions, their pain, and their hurt, and a, and a few months later, they were remarried, everybody, and are married to this day, serving God. Some of my closest friends, I was talking to them last night, just celebrating again. Yeah, come on, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate again, the miracle. And this is, this is what the husband said. This is for somebody today. I was asking, what did it really take in the middle of that? You couldn't see the end, so what did it take to keep fighting for that honesty? He said, the number one thing, if I could share anything with Highlands, it would be be obedient in the process. We were, whenever the voice of God said, do something, whenever we felt the Holy Spirit leading us, we just said yes to that and God restored. I hope that encourages you in every relationship. There is no dead end street. God always has a way to bring about restoration. But in the moment, the way we get there is step by step and it starts uh, with honesty. Here's our third lesson, conflict lesson number three comes from verse, the, the second part of verse 20, which are some of my favorite words in the entire Bible. You know, Joseph says, you intended to harm me but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Here's our third lesson. It requires secure faith, not casual faith. 
This is the part you got to dig in for. I'm gonna have to dig in for. If we're gonna stick it out God's way in the middle of conflict, we gotta have an anchored faith. We know who God is. And no matter what we see in the moment, check it, no matter what we feel in the moment, no matter what it looks like in the moment, we know God is a God who will never leave us or forsake us. And I'm anchored into that as the winds blow and as the storms rage and as the uncertainties are there. And when it's, it's more down than up, when it's in the middle of the trenches, I just know who God is. And that just bleeds off of Joseph. He said, you know, you intended to harm me. Here's the truth. But hey, everybody, God intended for good, for the saving of many lives, including yours. I'm the one that's here that has food now to provide for you. Who would have ever guessed? I love Romans 8, 28. We know in all things, we know our faith is rooted. We know in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. What a great scripture. We gotta get in our spirit. We gotta fight for it to be in our heart. It's like, you know, conflict is like a puzzle. My wife loves doing puzzles. I'm not, good, I'm not a good puzzler. I get so frustrated because I can't see it, right? It's just, it's, just a, it's chaos, you know? I think during 21 days, we did like 8,000 pieces total puzzle. Like she's like loves puzzles. We're, we're doing no media. So we just puzzled all, all 21 days. And I was like the whole, I'm so fascinated how all these individual things come together over time into a beautiful picture. And it's a picture you really can't see till the very last pieces are put in. Let that encourage us today. Come on, our life is that puzzle, but the good news is God has the big picture. God always sees the picture he's painting and anytime there's a, a curveball, anytime there's a side track, anytime we take an exit from God's path through his faithfulness, he can bring us back and he can bring it all to good. He doesn't want our pain. He doesn't want our hurt. He doesn't want conflict to become unhealthy. But even if it does, come on, our secure faith says our God is able. Right. Our God is able. How do we build that kind of faith? Well, Romans teaches us very clearly. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Can I encourage you? Now, this is, again, this is extraordinary because this is not just for the big conflicts. It's for the small ones. Get a verse to anchor yourself into in the conflict you are currently walking through. Get a verse, and what you'll immediately feel is a confidence that can only come from God. These first three lessons are amazing. I love the fact that Joseph teaches us that it starts within us. It takes complete honesty. It requires secure faith. But I think this last one may be the most powerful one, verse 21. Then he speaks to them, so then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. This is the, by far the most radical part of the story. <laughs> this is insane. I mean, this, these are the people who've heard him after all the pain, all the hurt, all the betrayal. Check it out. With no guarantee they wouldn't hurt him again. Here's our lesson. Joseph is free. When we do conflict resolution God's way, we are set free no matter what the other person's response is. When we walk God's path, we are not held in bondage by their response. That the work that God does inside of us, it sets us free, but not just free to be like, all right, I'm out of here, whatever, whatever. No, it sets us free for a purpose, to do good. Romans 12, 21, we are not overcome by evil as the people of God. We overcome evil with good. And we are set free to pray for that person, to believe for that person, to believe the best for that person. To, you know, there may need to be boundaries and that's, that's wisdom by the way. And that's, that's in all some of the content around conflict management. If someone's hurt you very badly, there may need to be boundaries, but boundaries don't stop prayer. There's many people that we need to do good to that are around us, we've been in conflict with and it's time for us to bless them, to encourage them, to bless their children, to bless their their community, whatever it might be that's connected to their life. I have freedom to do good because God has done good in me. Yeah. Amen, amen. <laughs> this is the way of Joseph. It's the first mention of forgiveness in the Bible. But it, y'all, it is just a glimmer, just a foretaste, an appetizer to the way of Jesus. The way of Joseph just shows us and opens our eyes to look in the New Testament that the very way that Joseph walked out that restoration is the way that Jesus lived his life here on earth. It's what makes it so powerful. You know, Jesus allowed it always to start within himself. He was sinless, but he took ownership of all of our sins. I'll take care of it. It starts inside of me. And he walked in complete honesty. Everywhere he went, the Bible says he spoke truth 
when someone was hurting, he wept. He lived a life of integrity and honesty, experiencing everything we would ever experience ourselves, but always with a perspective that we can have too. His perspective, not my will, but your will be done. He spoke those words on the way to a cross where he would go. He would die the death to set us free. That what he did for us on that cross, it has set us free, free to have relationship with him. Come on, somebody. And free to have conflict resolution and reconciliation and unity with the world around us. When we walk the way of Joseph, we are simply walking the way of Jesus. And that encourages me because when he came out of that grave three days later, come on, somebody, the same power that got him out of that grave now lives in us. If you can't clap right there, I don't know where you can clap. It's possible. It's possible. It's possible. Man, I love God's word. Don't you love God's word? Can I pray for you there? I feel the weight of the room right now. I feel with all of my heart without even knowing the specifics, the conflicts that we're all carrying around. And I don't want any of us, none of us. This is honestly the, this is the deepest prayer for our entire team as we walk towards every Sunday. I don't want anyone to leave here trying to do any of this in their own power. But for you to have an authentic, real relationship with that Jesus we just talked about, who did all of that so that you could have that relationship. Conflict resolution like anything else, in our own power is a miserable way to live. But with the power of God, it changes everything. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I wanna pray for you today, every location online. And I, I know if God's speaking to you, you already know it. If he's knocking on your heart for the first time for you to begin this relationship, you might even, maybe not even be sure how you ended up at Highlands today. You're, somebody just invited you. You just wanted to come and see what's going on or you've been around it but never had that moment where you really gave your life to God or this could be a lot of us you just recognize you've been living under your own power. You've known God in the past, but you've walked away. Today's the day to come back to him. Would never embarrass you or call you up front, do anything like that, but I do wanna pray for you. So on the count of three, every location, I wanna ask you, if, that, if, that, if that's something you want today, that relationship, that this is the day and you know it, on the count of three, just lift up your hands. One, two, three. Come on, if that's you, put your hands up. Anybody in this room, you want that relationship with Jesus, amen. I see your hand right there in the back. Come on, anyone else, any location, put your hand up. That's awesome, that's great. The Spirit of God is moving. I love it. Whether you raise your hand or not, I see your hand right there. Great job, great job. You can have this moment with God. It can change everything. Just pray these words to yourself. To Jesus today, I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, my mistakes. I turn away from all of that and I am running to you. Be my Lord, my Savior. God, I give you my life. I ask you to fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. God, right now, I bless those. Every location, those online, those in the correctional facilities, anyone who just prayed that prayer, God, you're already at work in their life. The old is gone and the new has come. God, bless them with supernatural peace and encouragement and strength to walk out of here today changed forever. Final prayer of the day. If you're here today and you're in any kind of conflict, which is probably most, most of us, if you would, just open your hands in your lap. If you need the wisdom of God, the strength of God, if you want to walk out this beautiful model of conflict resolution we read today. Just receive this prayer. God, I pray for the people of Church of the Highlands. God, I pray for myself in every area from the smallest to biggest conflicts that we would have the mind of Christ, that our hearts would be open, that we would allow you to be the banner that goes before us, God, that we would trust you to be our rear guard, that we would allow you to do what only you can do. God, it's gonna take faith. So I pray right now in the name of Jesus, you would stir faith in this church to trust you in the trenches, to trust you in the in-between, to know that you intend all things for our good. And God, there, there is a day coming where we'll understand. And as we walk this out, God, we pray for that person right now that maybe we're in conflict with. We pray blessing over them today. God, we pray encouragement over them today. God, we pray you're also softening their hearts so that we can have unity in the name of Jesus. God, we love you. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, put your hands together and celebrate all those who gave your life to Jesus.